Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bona fide culture and politics TV talk show. Tonight, as David Eby is set to be sworn in as BC's new premier after being acclaimed as the new leader of the BC NDP, let's talk to the woman who was disqualified from challenging him for those positions. But before we do, how did we get here? Well, on June 28th, BC Premier John Horgan announced that he would be resigning from the Premier's office, which meant that the governing BC NDP would launch a party leadership race, with the winner not only being the leader of the BC NDP, but the new Premier of BC. In July, outgoing BC Attorney General David Eby seemed to be the only candidate in the BC NDP's leadership race. But then, on August 10th, prominent climate activist and former federal NDP candidate for Vancouver Granville, Anjali Apatarai, joined the race. On September 8th, the BC NDP began investigating allegations that Anjali Apatarai's campaign violated the BC Elections Act. Then, on October 19th, the BC NDP party executive, based on the recommendations from the party's chief electoral officer, Elizabeth Cull, voted to disqualify Anjali Apatarai's campaign, stating that she broke campaign rules by improperly coordinating with third parties, particularly the nonprofit interest group Dogwood BC, which included the solicitation of fraudulent memberships. Apatarai has since denied the wrongdoing, and she's here to talk about it. She is, of course, Anjali Apatarai Anjali, so nice to see you. So nice to meet you in person. Yes, likewise. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's go back to the BC NDP, the party executive, based on the recommendation from the chief electoral officer, Elizabeth Cull, basically concluded that you were cheating. Now, I know that you had a formal response to this, but yeah. for people who haven't read that, what do you say to them when, when the party is saying, hey, you cheated in, in your bid to be the next leader of the BC NDP? Well, <clears throat> the language that Elizabeth Cull uses in the report um, sounds pretty damning when you read right. it. Um, but really, the devil's in the details. There were some legalistic uh, tricks that were that were used to paint a picture of a campaign that was dishonest and coordinating with third parties, and that simply wasn't the case. What we were actually dealing with was um, a set of rules that was changed midway through the race and then applied retroactively, hmm. um, rules that were taken from Elections BC that govern general election races and then um, sort of extrapolated to cover leadership races or this particular leadership race. Okay. And so um, that's really hard to convey to the public and to simplify into sound bites. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is that there's a <clears throat> distinction between coordinating with third parties and the, the the grassroots organizing that happens in, in any leadership race, particularly within the NDP. So let's talk about that, because that seems to be a bit of a gray area. We know that in any campaign, including leadership races, mm -hmm. Candidates and campaigns seek out the endorsement and support from a lot of third party organizations, be they business groups, be they unions, activists, mm -hmm. they seek those out. Where the line seems to be drawn is around this idea of coordination. And so when you have someone like uh, Alexandra Woodsworth on your campaign, mm -hmm. who is a campaign manager for Dogwood BC, but then also working on your campaign, mm -hmm. isn't that implicitly coordinating with a third party, the third yeah. party being Dogwood? No, great question. And so I think one thing, just like step one, is to be very clear that Elections BC itself was not involved in this process at any given point. Okay. And I wish they had been, but they hadn't. <laughs> uh, they didn't actually handle this investigation because they only were to step in after um, after I was an approved candidate. So, but under but under Elections BC law. Um, leadership races are, are, are governed by, by elections law that talks about advertising, mm -hmm. third party advertising, and not coordination. General elections have Elections BC rules around coordination. Oh, okay. And so, but those rules were reinterpreted on August 31st um, by Elizabeth Cull. Um, mm. And everything that had happened weeks prior to August 31st um, was then brought under the purview of these new reinterpreted rules. And that's kind of where the breakdown started to happen. Mm. And so um, under the general leadership race rules, what 
what we you can have is third parties having their having their own campaigns and then you can have volunteers from those third parties so we had two volunteers from dogwood who did some very much after hours non decision making work for us they were copy editing emails and writing e blasts okay um in those first weeks while the campaign was taking form and that would have been totally valid and above the board um, under regular elections BC rules. Mm -hmm. Then on August 31st, um, those rules were changed and then retroactively applied. And so then with this new light sort of cast upon all our activities of August, uh, of, of August um, uh, that sort of changed that changed the game. And that's, that's what Elizabeth Cole was using as the basis. What of you're describing sounds like the party was changing or moving the goalposts mid-campaign. Very much so. And so what you were doing was above board, and then suddenly it wasn't. Do you feel like the party had it out for you from the start? Uh, Not from the start. I think think when I came in, it was like, oh, cute. Here's an activist running. And, um, oh, wait a minute. There's thousands and thousands of people who seem to be responding to this this sort of qualitative shift in leadership that Mm -hmm. she's talking about and the values and the politics that she's bringing in. And that unprecedented response from across the province, which is what I had predicted would happen, because... I know as an activist and as an advocate, there is um, a huge number of people across this province who, who, who deeply want some kind of signal from leadership that there's going to be a set of transformative changes that will respond to this moment that mm-hmm. we're living through. And so I knew that would happen. The party did not see that coming, and they absolutely should have. And so I think from the point at which we had enough leverage to win, that was when... Um, the pieces started to be put into place. Really quickly, do you have the final number or close to the final number of how many members no. you ended up signing up? No, and there's no way how to How do you know not that. have that? Like I, I, I know. For the average person, they're going, well, how do you not have like some Excel sheet or some way of tracking yeah. the total number? Well, that's a beautiful thing about democracy. It's like when somebody goes to the website and they become a member of the party, no one in this world knows their motivation for doing that. The right. party wouldn't have that info either. We have clues. You know, you can set up tracking links. David Eby had tracking links to all the MLAs. Mm. You know, we could we set up tracking links from our website. Um, but what do you estimate in terms of the number of members that you signed up? I've heard rumors. You know, we had a really fantastically successful um, digital ad campaign. Our videos that were sort of like little bite-sized pieces of essentially policy Mm -hmm. um, had a huge success rate. We had 19,000 clicks straight to the BCNDP membership site. And so that wasn't a third party achievement. That was that was the politics of this campaign, which is has been my point since the beginning. And so you have clues, but no one has the full number. <laughs> You're not gonna give me a number. You're not well, gonna we say don't have I wish we 15, had fifteen thousand, ten thousand. I've heard rumors ranging from eight to fourteen thousand. Wow. So you were a candidate in the 2021 federal election. You were running for the federal NDP in Vancouver Granville, which is Jody Wilson Raybould's old riding. You had no issues there. You were very close to winning, actually. Mm -hmm. And so I have to ask, you were a great candidate there, but I've heard some chatter saying, you know, your ideas are a little out there for the BC NDP. Maybe you should join the Greens. So from your Mm. perspective, what is the difference between the federal NDP and the BC NDP? Because you you were smooth sailing with one, not so smooth sailing with the other. It's a great question, you know, and um, I think that this leadership race was was a great opportunity to have exactly that kind of conversation about how are the values of this party not aligning with uh, with its membership and with and with what supporters of the federal NDP want to see out mm-hmm. of this party. Um, you know, this is the only. Um, this is this is a, a provincial NDP government that has um, in charge of a province with a very particular economic setup right. that sets up some 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 big contradictions in terms of whose interests this government is representing. And so I have been very critical of the BC NDP as you know a, a climate and social justice advocate in the province, and that did come to light during my federal run. So you don't think they're doing enough on climate change action? I don't think they're doing enough to um, transform the structure of our province away from one that rewards corporate capital and essentially corporations for uh, resource extraction Mm -hmm. in 
our beautiful uh, province, well, much of which is unceded territory. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think they're doing enough to, first of all, extract enough public good out of that or to change that structure to set us up for a livable and climate safe future. And so a lot of folks think that, you know, there was this all this talk about me being a one issue candidate, climate mm-hmm. is one issue, and that's a green thing. And I think um, something that 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 we need to reclaim as new Democrats is the idea that climate is everything. It's it's all of it. It's our economy. Mm-hmm. It's our it's our healthcare system. It's all our public systems. Um, you know, when when a climate disaster happens, the people who get most affected by it are the most vulnerable. Right. And so in a new Democrat government, you need to have systems in place to protect those who are most vulnerable and to mm-hmm. sort of redistribute that um, that wealth that has gotten so polarized. So what do you say to someone who goes, hey, you're very intelligent. You clearly have a lot of courage. However, you've never had experience in public office. You did run in the 2021 federally, but it didn't pan out. So maybe you should run for MLA first, or maybe you should do, you know, X, Y, and Z first before trying to run for the leadership of a major political party and effectively the premiership of BC. What what do you say to that kind of dismissive approach? I mean... I get where folks are coming from, <laughs> but uh, it's it's that kind of political thinking that got us um, here in the first place. It's this this sort of like there's only one right way to do things. Got to go through the right channels. Mm-hmm. Got to know the right people. Got to look and sound the right way, and and that's how to affect change. And what we need right now is something completely and fundamentally different than the type of thinking that got us here in the first place. And so what we're talking about is a qualitative shift in what we're seeing from the leadership of this province. And that can really only come from the leadership. It's a set of values. It's um, it's a it's a signal um, of a shift towards an emergency level response to these completely extraordinary times that we're living in. Yeah. And it's a sort of um, the government meeting people where they're at and and saying, okay, no, you're not you're not out to lunch. We are actually living through some 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 very difficult and unprecedented times. And we are going to signal that we're going to act at the speed and scale required to meet the moment. And we simply haven't seen that from leadership. And so um, I think that that it's less to do with, oh, how, you know, how much experience of a very particular narrow sort do you have uh, that you bring to this office, but rather what are the values you bring, what are the leadership skills you bring, and what is the type of change that you're signaling? Sure. So given all that, give me your assessment of David Eby, who is set to be our new premier. I have a lot of respect for David Eby, and you know, as you saw in the first couple months of the leadership race, we weren't really campaigning against each other. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, I think he's done some fantastic things in government, and will hopefully uh, we will hold his feet to the fire to stay accountable to some of the things that he's promised he'll do. So then what are your next steps? Because you've made it very very clear that you want to stay in this party. You haven't sort of given any indication that you're going to join the BC Greens or maybe go back to the federal NDP. What is your plan next? <laughs> you know you know the saying, like, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. <laughs> <laughs> that could be that a great thing, campaign right? <laughs> slogan. You should do that. I like it. Yeah. I mean, I disagree fundamentally with a lot of the actions that our government has taken since 2017. And that doesn't make me any less of a new Democrat as much as the party would like to paint it. So um, I'm going to I think it's incredibly important. Part of one of the purposes that I went in with um, into this leadership race was to demonstrate that the party system cannot deliver the changes that we need on its own. Hmm. There needs to be a reexamined relationship with the social movements that are alive and thriving in this province that are indigenous led, that are very much a few steps ahead of the government at any given time. Right. And those two systems of democracy, because to me, social movements are a critical, essential piece of democracy. Those two systems need to work together and have a healthier relationship. The party was founded on that premise, and um, and that's why it's it's the party that I'm going to cry about. But <laughs> but they've lost sight of that, and sure. they need to come back to that. And um, so I, so I think it's equally important to put pressure from the outside as it is from the inside, and we're going to do both. So really quickly, 2024 general provincial election. Are you <laughs> running under the BCNDP banner? Is that Probable. 
That remains to be seen. I knew you I'm were going to say that. Can't you I just can't be like, probably. Spill any tea uh, right here on TV with you, you know? Anjali, you spilled plenty of tea. This was really a delight to chat with you. Thank you so much Thanks, for your time Will. tonight. Folks, she's a climate change activist, a political powerhouse with an extremely bright future. She is, of course, Anjali Apaterai. We will be recording some overtime with Anjali, so be sure to find This Is Van Color wherever you listen to your podcast for more. Now stick around, because after some business, let's examine what legal recourse Anjali might have, whether she chooses to exercise it or not. We're going to do that in a brand new segment, and that is up next. I'm Mo Amir. This is Van Color.